The following special presentation, Gift of Hope, is brought to you by Fresenius Medical Care, North America. The wait for a donor, they tell you, can be anywhere from five to ten years. It's a lifetime. It's very important to realize that organs aren't produced. They're not collected. They're gifted. The light at the end of the tunnel, you don't really, you don't see that. There are somewhere between 10 and 12 times more people actively waiting for a kidney transplant than there are available donors and available organs. Not many people in your lifetime, I think, ever looks you in the eye and say, you, you changed my life. I'm Colton Bradford. 17 people will die today and every day in this country while waiting for an organ. Now over the next half hour, we'll explore what it's like to wait, what it's like to give, and we'll answer many questions that you might have if you're considering the selfless gift of hope. While people wait, there is a lot of work that's being done. Work dedicated to providing quality of life to patients. One, two, three. <laughs> When I was pregnant um, with my second child, I was told that there was something going on with my kidneys. They basically told me that I should see a nephrologist after the pregnancy was, was complete to, to find out what was going on. So I went in to that appointment and met with the nephrologist for, I swear to you, what seemed like five minutes. And he says to me, yeah, so your kidneys are pretty much gone. You're gonna probably need dialysis within a year. And I was like, what? Like, what do you, what? I was so mad and angry and sad. Like, I just didn't know what I was gonna do. Like, here I am, I was a new mom. I now have two girls. I work full time plus, right? Trying to make ends meet and now I was told I was gonna need dialysis. And um, when I left there, there was like a bench and I plopped down on the bench and I just cried. Like I just, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I really thought I was dying, right? It's like you go through grief and a part of you has died and now you're mourning it. At the age of 30, um, I was diagnosed with high blood pressure. After 17 years after seeing this doctor, my high blood pressure was still, in, uh, still on medication for high blood pressure. When I transferred over to another doctor, the first couple of visits I was told that my numbers were off on my kidney. I've been going to the doctors, never ever never had a conversation about kidneys failing failing at all with anyone, either doctors I've been seeing. Um, so he did a little bit of research and found out my doc, my kidneys have been failing for the past 10 years. I learned that at that time there was no, there was no saving the kidney that I was working with right now. I found out I needed a transplant. Patients with kidney failure um, have to make some very important decisions. The first cut point is, do they get active therapy or do they, uh, are they sick enough and ill enough uh, that comfort care and, and, and conservative therapy is best for them? If you go down the track that active therapy is something that's desirable to try, then I would look at transplant first as the option of greatest opportunity for each individual. Everything else beyond that human kidney 
is something that never will live up to what a normal human functioning kidney does. And then dialysis becomes the, uh, the next most uh, important question to ask. Dialysis is a form of renal replacement therapy in which um, the patient undergoes a procedure to both clear the toxic materials that build up that normally the kidney would remove. Dialysis itself is something that's done reproducibly, incredibly safely, uh, time in and time out. And we become very good at making what is really a very complex procedure quite routine. For the first 55 years of dialysis therapy, it was building out broad access to care, predominantly in healthcare centers in the last few years of trying to have more patients given the power and choice to choose where they want to achieve their treatment and in fact in doing that improve their quality of life and many of those patients have selected home a home-based therapy as a method of therapy. I had a decision to make whether if I wanted to do what type of dialysis I wanted to do. The decision I came up with was home therapy, the home uh, dialysis. I could still continue to work. I could still live a little normal life. All right, thank you. So when you when you start dialysis, you're told basically for the average time was about five years being on dialysis. Do so you want to try to get your mind off it? So, but being on it, and for uh, for the, the amount of time you are, the light at the end of the tunnel, you don't really you don't see that. You don't see that light at the end of the tunnel. I guess my doctor must have realized that he gave me like a gut blow because shortly after his, nef his um, nurse practitioner called me and she reached out to me and was like, I wanted to touch bases with you to give you some more options. And I'm like, there's options? She told me about dialysis. She told me about um, home hemo. I think I was nervous too much. <laughs> Just a little bit. So I started home hemo, and that process is very similar to traditional dialysis, okay? Um, I am hooked up to the dialysis machine for about three hours. That's my prescription. And my body is being cleansed through blood. So it's going into the machine. Um, it goes into what they call a dialysizer, which is like your kidney and it's cleansing the blood and then it's returned back to you. I do that five days a week. Home Hemo has enhanced my life tremendously. It has given me much more energy than I've ever had before. It has given me flexibility um, to be able to participate in, you know, life. Every hospital is different. Everybody has their requirements as to what your weight needs to be, um, what your health status needs to be. But once my BMI is where it needs to be, then I can become active on the list and hopefully move up to be able to receive that transplant. I'm actually looking at possibly a live donor. I have an older daughter, she's 22 now. She's very hopeful to be able to be a live donor for me to be able to donate one of her kidneys to me. So that's kind of the path that we're, we're hoping to take. It's really hard um, because it's not something I really want her to do. I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel like, what if she needs it? You know, like, what, what if she needs her, her kidney down the road? Or what if one of her kids need it? Like, it just feels like a selfish thing to do. So, it's really hard to accept. It's really hard to accept or to consider because that's your child and you feel like you're supposed to do everything for them and protect them and for her to have to do that for me, it's just a lot, it's a lot. I'm sorry. But I know she wants to, and she's her mother's child, so she's very stubborn. <laughs> so if the doctors tell her she could do it, she's going to do it. Uh, 
my little is one. She's asked why I can't I get one of her kidneys, you know. <laughs> I just try not to worry her too much because she's seven, but she wants to help too. So after, after three years, you're going through that depression. The fourth year came and you're, you're discussing with your doctor and everything about what's going on. You still have that weary, you still don't see the light on who's gonna come up. So you're really worried about where or how you're gonna get a kidney. There are somewhere between 10 and 12 times more people actively waiting for a kidney transplant than there are available donors. Some of the things that I think are important for people to understand is that as we take on a goal for trying to aspire to have more kidney transplants and organs available, whether it's kidneys, lungs, heart, uh, livers, other things are truly life-saving uh, procedures. So the need for kidney outpaces every other organ, and that makes up 84% of the total list of patients waiting for any organ transplant. I think it's really important to say first that the U.S. has a very high performing system. In fact, we're one of the world's best donation and transplant systems. So while our system is not broken, it's not yet meeting the need. And that drives that urgency that we all have. So what's the reason for the gap? Only about 2% of patients that die in a hospital have any medical opportunity for organ donation. A key piece of that is that the death needs to occur such that the patient is on a ventilator so that the organs remain viable for transplantation. And then also again, that the donor uh, as an individual was healthy enough and didn't have certain diseases that would be detrimental to the transplant recipient. One of the unique aspects about this gap is that, you know, generally when people think about supply and demand, it would seem that if there's such a big demand, we should be able to respond with the supply. But it's very important to realize that organs aren't produced. They're not collected. They're gifted from one human being to another. And under circumstances that are critical and fragile and emotional. And that's a key piece of understanding how this entire system really can um, works and how it thrives and how we can continue to develop it. Hi, I'm Bill Valley, CEO of Fresenius Medical Care North America. We're honored to underwrite this special program focused on the importance of organ transplant. I hope this program shines light on the difference one person can make. We're the nation's leading provider of kidney care products and services, and we're proud to call Boston home for our headquarters. Every day, our team of nearly 70,000 employees cares for tens of thousands of people living with kidney disease, and each deserves to live their life to its fullest. That includes empowering more people to do their dialysis at home, to take control of their disease and thrive. It's that conviction that shapes not only the care we provide, but also our commitment to research and innovation, ensuring that we're developing new machines, technologies, and therapies, so people living with kidney disease can live their best life. We established the Fresenius Medical Care Foundation in 2018 to help the patients, families, and communities most greatly impacted by kidney disease. Through the foundation, we are focused on raising awareness of kidney disease and transplant as a life-saving solution. For many, the gift of transplant truly is the gift of life. Thousands of people continue to wait, hoping for the chance to receive this life-saving gift. We are committed to delivering superior care that improves the quality of life of every patient every day. On behalf of our team at Fresenius Medical Care North America, thank you for taking time to learn more about transplant.
So after the fourth year, a little over four years, um, I had a really hard time one night on, this, on the machine. I had a really, really bad night, and I, I really had it. They said a gentleman walked in, wanted to donate his kidney, which I was like, just walked in out, out of nowhere. They said, yeah, and I'm a match, and they said, yeah, and they wanted to operate and um, put and do the transplant. I can't say enough how ecstatic I was. After the kidney transplant, you, have to, you asked if you wanted to meet the donor. I jumped on board. To, wanted to meet this gentleman who wanted to reset my life. When he came into the room, it was like a connection was already established. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. I, can't, I really can't. What to do? Yeah? Like I said, it's something I've been thinking about. Mm -hmm. You just made a world of difference. John was so appreciative and so thankful. Um, it, it was just a, an incredible experience. John cried through probably at least half of it. He was a very half, emotional so. yeah. guy. I didn't know that, didn't expect that. <laughs> and so I remember walking back to my room just shaking my head like, wow, what just happened? Wow, that was something special. Mm -hmm. Not bad, huh? Excellent. We meet every month for breakfast. So we meet, well, it's, a, it's a new friend in my life, no doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> now we kid around like we've been friends forever. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty awesome. Give me a break. Oh my. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> I became interested in donating my kidney after my wife actually uh, donated her kidney. It was about a year before that, before I decided to. And so um, I got to see her go through the entire process. It certainly um, something that I, I probably should have considered um, a long time ago. The wait, so, you know, the wait for a donor, they tell you can be anywhere from five to ten years. It's a lifetime, right? A, a whole lifetime. It gets me every once in a while, and I can get a little somber and a little sad um, just because I'm uncertain of what my future looks like. I wanna see my grandchildren um, and things like that. So when you think of a need for a kidney, you think of a person's lifespan. I have been looking for a kidney now for four and a half years. I decided to, to start looking for a donor because I didn't, when I first found out I had kidney disease and I went on to the transplant list, they told me it was a five to six year wait period. And I didn't want to wait that long. To find a donor, I have <clears throat> done fundraising and raised money with that money, I raised enough money to put a billboard up for a month. And with that, I got a lot of responses. Um, unfortunately, still didn't find a kidney. I've had multiple different designs of t-shirts made that basically state, you know, mother needs kidney. I also have a website and on that website is a link to Mass General Hospital to fill out the survey to see if you can be a donor. I don't even know how many people offered to fill out the survey. That's the first step, is you fill out a survey with Mass General Hospital. And my biggest thing is I, I tell people I'm looking for a donor, but if you're willing to donate to me and you're not a match to me, maybe you can still give that kidney to somebody else. The fact that if you're in need of a kidney transplant, then you have the possibility of receiving a living donor organ, which is a really important part of how we're going to address the need for kidney transplantation. On the other hand, kidney transplantation and patients who are waiting for kidney have dialysis as essentially a bridge therapy. That's not the case for other organs. For example, hearts and lungs or livers in particular, when patients become critically ill, 
So we focus on kidneys because the demand is so significant, but we also recognize that there is real need for all organs. I don't remember waking up. My wife uh, says that uh, I was barely breathing. And at that point, uh, they, uh, uh, my wife took me to uh, the emergency room where they essentially told me that I had contracted an E. coli infection within the last several days and that uh, all my organs were, uh, were indeed shutting down at that time. Over the next now three weeks, three to four weeks, uh, my organs started to come back one by one except my liver. And uh, that's when they said that a liver transplant was the only way that I was going to survive uh, um, over the long term. And I think what makes my uh, particular uh, situation unique um, is that I did accept a high risk liver. There was a situation where um, a young man, um, uh, I believe he was 21 years old, uh, died of an opioid uh, overdose. And uh, um, that's uh, the liver that was then transplanted into me. It was hepatitis C uh, infected. Um, so at that point I became a hepatitis C patient. Just a few months later, the hepatitis C was eliminated. What we tell the public is don't ever take yourself off the list. And that's because medical standards change over time. For example, five years ago, if an individual had hepatitis, that would likely have been considered a rule out, hepatitis now being a disease that can be treated or even cured. It's no longer a rule out for organ donation. Just like other parts of the healthcare system, organ donation and transplantation is also an area where we need to look very carefully at what the disparities are in access. We know that transplantation is not accessible for all patients who really might benefit from transplant. Yes, we, we do see disparities in, um, in the uh, minority communities and uh, underrepresented communities when it comes to uh, access to healthcare and uh, really information about organ donation. Um, you know, as it is true for many areas of the healthcare system, uh, these vulnerable communities are uh, really uh, suffering from higher prevalence of diseases uh, like hypertension, diabetes, uh, obesity that will um, drive uh, their disease into this stage where they need actually an organ. There, there is a, this disparity is really uh, that we see. It comes to uh, a lot of, of it has to do with uh, determinants of health, and, uh, which is pretty variable, uh, which means that certain conditions will make them more uh, prone to develop these diseases and it ranges from uh, socioeconomic status, education, uh, insurance, uh, access to information, transportation to get to medical centers that can actually provide this kind of care. Along those lines, there is also a potential mistrust from certain groups into our healthcare system. There is also a systematic problem into uh, physicians that can have uh, their own unconscious bias when providing care to some populations. Unconscious bias are uh, those uh, stereotypes that we all have and we can have certain stereotypes towards certain populations that, um, that may affect our decision making and it's all unconscious. Uh, I mean, there are certain beliefs in, in certain communities where they may feel that that is out of reach and uh, that is not a therapy that it's given to somebody coming from those communities. Uh, uh, maybe because they don't have the uh, socioeconomic status or uh, because they feel that they are uh, too sick to get something like that. I think one of the things that we as medical community need to do is increase our own diversity of the workforce. Uh, so this way uh, we can really engage with these communities.
I would say for everyone who is uh, thinking uh, about becoming a donor, um, I would um, first of all want to make sure that everyone understands what are the common myths about that. Um, one of those is that if you once you are registered as a donor, whether you will receive the same uh, care from your medical providers when you get into a medical facility, and that's absolutely the case. Everything will be done to save your life. You know, donation only starts after really everything has been done. If you looked at genetic sequencing specifically for um, uh, organ donorship, uh, saliva is one method that is being developed and can be used now to, to look at whether you are um, a good match towards um, somebody who needs a kidney or needs a heart or needs a lung. And so uh, I think that our ability to use this normalization of doing genetic analysis to try to understand who potential donors might be and to encourage people to understand where they might be good donors is a huge opportunity for developing a broader conversation about living donorship. My organization is responsible for coordinating deceased donation and when a medical opportunity arises for organ donation, we're checking the deceased donor registry. That's the registry that you indicate you want to be a donor after you die. This is often done through your license at the time of license renewal. But there's a new innovation that is about to come out that I think is really exciting that will help facilitate living donation. And what we want to do now through Donate Life America is establish a living donor registry so that individuals who are interested in being a living kidney donor, even if it's for a specific patient, if it turns out they're not a match for that individual, can go into a registry and then be quickly matched with someone who's in need of a kidney. This is a game changer for living donation. If it even just crosses your mind that maybe you want to do it, look into it. Like, just go see what the process is. Get some more information because you could save a family. Not just a, one life, but a whole family. I want them to know that the legacy of their the young man in their life will continue and my obligation my responsibility to him and to them is to live a better life than i had ever lived in the previous uh, part of my life uh, because this individual has given me a second chance well it's been a tremendous experience and i i recommend it for for anyone who, who's considering donating If you think you could change someone's life, this is the way to do it. Um, if you want to be someone's hero in someone's life, this is the way to do it. I feel great right now in my space right now because of you. And I want to really, really thank you for that. I thank you. If you are interested in becoming an organ, eye, or tissue donor, you can register now at the National Donate Life Registry. For more, visit DonateLife.net. How's the coffee? Good, not bad. Yeah. It's all right. Not mine, but it's good. Oh, yours is better? Oh, my coffee is awesome. This special presentation, Gift of Hope, was brought to you by Fresenius Medical Care, North America.